All right, team. Welcome to our 18th lecture. And today we will be covering shortest path and all shortest path. We will also learn what minimum spanning tree is, but I wanted to divide the class into two parts because for the best algorithm, like most efficient minimum spanning tree algorithm, it would be great to cover these joint sets as well. So we will have a follow-up lecture on Monday or Tuesday in which we will cover these joint sets first and then minimum spanning tree. So, let's start with short step. The problem is, we are given a graph and we want to find the shortest path, which is um, basically a path in which the total sum of the weights of edges is minimum from the source node to the destination node. So, let's start with the easy version first. Let's say in our graph, all the weights have edge 1. So, they all the eights have weight 1, then how can we find the shortest path? Yes? BFS. BFS. Like basically, we can start from the start point, from the source node, and then we can run BFS, and in the first iteration, what will happen is, like if we start from 0 and our 8 is to reach to 7, in the first iteration, zeros, children are 1 and 3. And these two are going to be inserted into our queue with distance 1. And in the second iteration, let's say first we get 1, 2 is going to be inserted with distance 2. And after that, since 0 was already visited, we are not going to insert 0 into Q again. And we are done with 1 at this point. And now we are processing 3. And 3 has the first child 0, since 0 is already visited, we don't do anything. And the second child 4, 4 is not visited yet, therefore 4's distance is 3's current distance, which is 1, plus 1, so it is 2. And 7's distance becomes 3's current distance is 1, plus 1, which is 2. And since we reached our destination, there is no point continuing execution, because BFS guarantees us that the, like whenever we find the first path to a destination, it's actually the shortest one. Any questions about this? Why BFS is working for a graph in which all the edge weights are one? Is it clear to everybody? Okay, cool. So, how about the edge weights are not one? But they are all positive integers. Any other ideas? Let's think about it for a minute. BFS minus 4 can be split if the first distance is not this. The destination, the A is going to have larger weight, and the longer path with laser display. We have uh, some of its weights, so yes. Better than the other. Yes. So we we may need to explore every part and. Between. So like basically, what I'm getting from your answer is BFS does not work if we use it as it is. And it would be nice to see it on an example, I think. So let's try to come up with a graph in which BFS is not going to give us, uh, like with the first path, it's not going to give us the shortest distance. Let's say we have 1, and then we have 2 here, and then we have 3 here, and this x weight is 1, and this x weight is 99, and like from 1 to 4, there is an edge which is 2, and from 4 to 3, there is an edge 3. So basically, from 1 to 3, the shortest path is actually 5, mm -hmm. as you see, like if we get these two edges. But if we run BFS, let's say if 2 is the first child that we look for, then we are going to insert 2 with distance 1, and then from, um, let me see, yes, after, after that first 2 is going to be executed before 4, and then 2 is going to insert 3 with distance 100, which is definitely not the shortest path. So yes, BFS is not working. But can we actually do slight modification on BFS to make it work? Instead of using a queue, how about we use a priority queue, right? So basically, 
the reason BFS was working in the version where all the edge weights are one is because it is guaranteed that every time when we are doing iteration on a node, like that node has been reached with the shortest path, plus that distance is the shortest distance that is not covered so far. Like all the other distances that are generated in the graph, if they are shorter, they have been considered already. And here we should actually try to apply the same principle. Like basically, if there is a shorter path, that should be considered before than the longer versions. So uh, let's try to execute this. Like let's try to execute BFS with priority queue in this graph. Now we start with from node one. So let's say this is our priority queue. And we inserted one with distance zero, because distance from one to one is zero. And then we insert its children into our priority queue with their corresponding distances. Like we basically pop, it's like normal BFS. We pop. So we don't have this anymore, but we are going to update on zero. So since two is not visited yet, we basically insert two with distance one. And then we also insert four with distance two. So this is a mean heap, right? What's that? This, this is, is a mean heap. heap. Yes, this is a mean heap. And after that, since we are done with one, we are going to pop from our queue, and this time we get two with one. This is gone. <coughs> now four two is here. So we visited this guy, we visited this guy too. And right now we are considering inserting two children into priority queue. The first children we look for is one. And since one is already visited, we don't do anything with that. And two second children is three. Two second child is three. And two's current distance is one. And I have an edge with weight 99. So what is going to be the total distance to three? 100. Therefore, I insert three with 100 into my priority queue. And after that, I'm done with processing two as well. So I continue with the next node, uh, sorry, next value that comes from the priority queue. So I pop the top element, and this time we get four, two. So there is no four, two here anymore, so this is three, 100. And right now I am considering four children. First child is one. Since one is already visited, we don't do anything about that. And then the second child is three. Three is not visited yet. Don't forget that when are we marking things that visited in this algorithm? When we pop them. Because before popping them, it is still possible that we can reach to them with a shorter path. And when this happens, since three is not visited, and the distance of four is two, and two plus three is five, what we do is, we go to this priority queue, and then we update the value of three. Alternatively, you can insert the same node again and again, but in that case, your worst case time complexity is gonna get worse. So, what you should do for a good implementation is, you should have a cross-reference to values in your priority queue, so that you can go directly update them. And depending on your language of choice, it might be possible to decrease the priority of values. Maybe there are some priority queue implementations in your preferred language, which already keeps this cross-reference, and then uh, can go and update that value immediately. So let me show you these two alternatives. In the first case, we do not have cross-reference, so we just insert the node again with better distance. So here I reach to three with distance five, right? And three is not visited yet, or three is not completed yet. I think completed would be a better word than visited here, because it was visited through two before. But it's not, the process is not completed yet. 
So <laughs> therefore, at this point, what we do is, like the first alternative, we don't have cross-reference. So we cannot make any updates in the values in our priority queue. Therefore, we insert it again. And we insert three with five distance. And what is gonna happen since this is mean here? It's gonna go up. And we will have three 100 coming down here and three five going up here. So, are there any other child of four? No. Therefore, I'm done with processing four. It's marked as completed two. And I get one more element from priority queue. This time we get three with five. And three checks if it has any child who hasn't been completed yet. There is none. Therefore, three is marked as completed two. And this guy is popped. So we have three 100 here. And I pop from my priority queue again. This time I see that three was already completed. Therefore, I don't do anything about it. And since my priority queue is empty, I am done with processing at this point. And all these distances are minimum. Starting from source node one, like we basically calculate the shortest path to all the other nodes, all the other vertices. So any questions about how it played out once we don't do any updates? So can you see why we might have a lot of repeated elements in the priority queue this way? Like we can basically put the edges in the order in a way that like the node will always get like better and better results with the help of updates that come from newly completed nodes. So this way we can have like somewhere closer to E elements in our priority queue, which is gonna affect our worst time complexity. But if we actually keep cross-reference and go into priority queue and directly update that node's value, what would have happened? Let's see. So we had three 100 here, right? Let's backtrack. And at this point, we are at node four. Four is, we are processing four, four is complete, and we are considering its children. One was already visited, so we don't do anything. Three is not completed yet, therefore, I consider inserting a new value for three, and my current distance was two. Plus three, the distance that I'm considering for three is five. And at this point, what I do is I check if five is smaller than the current value of three in the priority queue or not. So I have cross reference, therefore I can go from node three to the corresponding node in the priority queue. So this way I see that five is smaller than 100. And I update 100, I replace it with five, and then I upkeep this node. Like here, since there is only one node, the upheap is not gonna make anything. But imagine we could have had a heap like that. Like we have 110 here, and then we have three 100 here. So at this point, once I do this update to the distance of three and I decrease it from 100 to five, what is gonna happen? What needs to happen? We need to upheap, right? So that we can continue having, uh, like satisfying the heap criteria. Therefore, at this point, we can get this cost of log n. Because this time, since we put cross-reference, how many elements can I have the most in my priority queue? n. Therefore, the complexity is going to come down to um, like n log n, like since I'm up applying all these updates. But I think it's going to be like, uh, let's do the time complex analysis after uh, VCD implementation. Any questions up to this point? Is everybody, yes? Um, wouldn't it be difficult to do the heap implementation, like uh, modifying the, the cross-reference method? Um, I wouldn't say so. If you, if you implement your own heap, for example, what you're supposed to do is you should have or an extra memory. And from these cells, you, like, since basically this is numbered in the order of the vertex numbers, it's going to be very easy to come from heap to here, right? So we don't really have to keep any reference. Like, let's say you are considering this heap node, 
What is the corresponding cell here? It's the first cell. Or like cell number one, let's say, because we have cell number zero here. So there is no difficulty going from here to this list, right? But the difficulty is from going here to there. Or like going from a node to corresponding node in here, let's say. Therefore, what we do is we keep cross-reference. So from here, we have like from three. Or like if our if our heap is like this, let's say this is not the case. From three, we have cross-reference to this heap node. And from one, we have cross-reference to this heap node. And every time we apply swap operation, we need to update here too. By yes. cross-reference, you mean uh, left array will keep the indexes of, for example, in one, it will keep the index of one in the min heap, like zero, for example. Yes. So let's say, I mean, we are not keeping heap in the tree structure, right? It is, since it's a complete binary tree, it's very easy to keep it in an array structure. Therefore, uh, this has index zero and this has index one. And let's say it was three and 100 at the beginning. So here in three, I have one. And in, in one, I have zero. And zero and two, they are not in the heap, so we don't care about the values in here. And let's say the update three, five comes in. What I do is first I change this to five. And then I call the up heap, right? And here, whenever I apply a swap operation in the heap, I should also apply the same in my cross-reference array. Like here, three, five is going up and one, ten is going down after the update. So, which nodes did I switch? Like one and three, sorry, like I asked, yeah, which, yeah, which nodes did I switch one and three, right? From my graph. Therefore, I go here and then I apply the swap operation between their cross references as well. So I say one is now in one and three is now in index zero in my min heap. Is this clear? So any questions like, if there is something vague or uh, gray, please ask it now. This would be difficult to track if you're using uh, the heaps of already like established. Yes, if, if you are using like already existing heap with no cross-reference, it will be tricky to do that. Because because of the abstraction, I don't think you can get this uh, in these numbers easily. Or like when you, uh, when you insert something, it's not going to give you, okay, so this is swapped with this, this is swapped with this information. I mean, so we could look for the element in log n time, but I don't know if that's any better. What's that? We could look for the element in log n time. How, how are you going to do that? Like, we could, uh, how do you know whether it's on the left or on the right? It still take a lot of, of n time, that's not perfect. That's not fair. It's, uh, it's going to take a while time to search out. Linear search. That's why we are actually keeping the cross reference, right? If it was log n, then you could have said, uh, it's log n, it's not going to cost too much. And uh, the other alternative is like, you can consider not, you can consider having the same node multiple times in the queue. Like if you are looking for not implementing a uh, heap by yourself, then what you can do is, you can insert the same element again and again, but this time, like your worst time complexity is going to be increased. So let's do the analysis after seeing the code for both versions then like you will see the trade-off and depending on your circumstances you can choose which one you want to go with. But like as you see under some circumstances it can be very handy to know the implementation of a data structure which for which you already have built in functions in your preferred programming language. So that's why like from the beginning we started with very basic tools like we learned how to start fire with just two wood sticks. And now we are using the lighter. But sometimes still using the wood sticks can be handy. Sometimes the lighter runs out of gas. Yes. Uh, on your first execution, instead of waiting for a heap to be exhausted, uh, what if we uh, mark it? Uh, what if we end our execution once we pop an element to uh, the uh, destination? Uh, yes, like if you are given, yeah, definitely, you can add that shortcut because like if you look at the execution here, basically we find short spread from given source to all the destinations. 
And um, if you are using priority queue, whenever you pop the element, if that popped element is your destination, there is no point continuing execution after that point. So because it's current, we, what's that? In this case, we continue to, until the hit is into the, to find the shortest distance to all the Yes, yes. But if we have a defined destination. Yes, if we were given destination, we didn't have to do that. Because once you, but this is important, not once we put the node into priority queue. Once it is popped out, we are, it is guaranteed that uh, the shortest path is calculated for that node. Is this clear, guys? Because this is important. Like some uh, people who are just learning this algorithm, they make this mistake. When they put the element into priority queue, they think that it's going to be shortest path. Like we actually had an example. That's not the case. We guarantee the shortest path once we pop it out from the priority queue. Any more questions about this? If not, let's take a look at the implementation. So, initially, we start with initializing the distance with zero, and we create a priority queue. And then, we basically mark all the distances infinity and previous node as undefined, in this queue, and like basically that's what we add into priority queue. So here in this algorithm, we also keep track of the shortest path. Like we are, we are not just interested in the distance, we also keep track of the shortest path. Like how to get there from the shortest path, basically. So after that, we start execution and we get the minimum element from the priority queue, minimum distance. And for each neighbor of that vertex, we check whether the distance we have so far plus the weight of the edge between us is smaller than what we have seen for this node before. Like, look at the line 80. So, alt stands for alternative route, we can think of. And our alternative route is the current distance of our current node, which is u, plus the edge weight or the length of the edge between the neighbor and the current node. If this is smaller than what we have seen so far, what does that mean? I have a shorter route. I have a shorter path. Therefore, I need to update my existing path. And what I say is the distance is updated with the alternative distance. And right now, the shortest path that I know to V goes over U. That's why I only keep track of the previous node. Like imagine, we start from one node and we are trying to go to another node. Another node. If I have a shortest path, is it possible to have a cycle in the shortest path? No. Definitely not, right? I mean, one of the edges is unnecessary, I can remove that. So. It is guaranteed that there is no cycle. If there is no cycle, obviously it's a tree, right? I mean, it's it's actually kind of like linked list, even there is no uh, branching, I mean, if it's between two nodes. So in that case, I can basically have a previous reference to create all the shortest paths. Meaning, I start from one. One doesn't have any previous node because that's the start point. So, four. The shortest path from 1 to 4 is the direct edge between, right? Therefore, the previous of 4 is going to be 1. And for 2, it's the same thing. Like the shortest path to 2 from 1, it's the direct edge. Therefore, the previous node for 2 is going to be 1. If you remember our execution first, we were considering this edge, right? At that point, we say the shortest path that I know to 3 is 100. And the previous node is 2, because I came to 3 through 2, right? And when I find an alternative route with a shorter distance, what I did was, okay, so I don't come to 3 from 2 anymore, I found the shorter path, and this time I am coming to 3 from 4. And the total distance is 5. Like, as you see, by keeping track of from which node I come to this node, I can basically keep track of all the shortest paths from given source nodes to all the other nodes. Is this part clear to everybody? 
Because like shortest path, it's like a line, and in a line, every node has previous, right? Except the source one. So just by keeping track of pre, uh, like previous, we can basically co construct the shortest path for uh, all of the nodes for the given source node. Is this part clear? So now let's get back to the algorithm and continue execution of the rest. So at this point, we are decreasing the priority. This means like updating its distance value. Like if you remember the first path we found to three, its distance was 100. And then we found an alternative path with distance five. At that point, we need to update its priority so that it can go up in my mean priority queue. It's actually increasing the priority. Um, I mean, here I think like dating of this priority queue is this is min priority queue. I mean, you can think of that way too. Like if you think that the root node has the highest priority, you are increasing the priority. If you think the root node has the lowest priority, you are decreasing the priority. Th that was the language that they used in Wikipedia. I get the uh, quote from the Wikipedia and I didn't change it, but I think the concept is clear to everybody, right? By decreasing, we mean like its, its level is going to go up in the tree. Or in the worst case, it's going to stay. But it's not going down. And once my queue is empty, I basically calculated all the shortest distances. And the, with the help of previous array that I filled up, I can construct the shortest path for any given node starting from the source node. And now let's think of the time complexity. So how many elements, like how many times this while loop is going to iterate? H times. H times? Let's think about it. H there plus, is only H plus uh, vertex times. Vertex Let's think plus, about it. Uh, Let's <laughs> not just talk about First think about <laughs> that. <laughs> yes. No, vertex times. Vertex times, yes. Like if you, if you look at here, like every time I pop one vertex, right? And then I'm done with it. And next time I, I continue with the next vertex. Therefore, this while loop, other while loop, it is executed vertex times or n times or v times. And let's also take a look what is happening inside. So in the worst case, like if everything is connected, inside I will consider each edge for update. Therefore, I have V coming from the outer loop times here. How much operation do I do? Actually, it's not multiple multiplication, it's plus. The reason is I am not visiting all the edges for every vertex, right? If you think about it, all the it's like VFS. All the edges are going to be processed only once. It's going to be considered only once whether it's making update or not. Therefore, like inside, I will have complexity of E, number of edges. But at the same time, there is one more call here, which is this priority call. So how many elements can I have in my priority queue the most? B. Yes. And what is the cost of decreasing priority or like applying any kind of update to my priority queue? Log V. Log V. So basically, I have V elements in my queue, uh, in my priority queue, and at each operation, I can basically apply log V, right? Then what is going to be the time complexity here? What's that? Actually, I think it should be E times log V. Yes. There's a typo. Yes. Yes. Type yes. Because for each edge, we can do this decrease prior priority thing. So that's why we construct it here. Yes. Any questions about this? But let's think a little more. Maybe we can actually have a tighter bound. I think it's going to be E log V. I mean, at least with this implementation, without any more improvements, for each edge, we can possibly make an update in our uh, 
priority queue, and in that case, this is going to be the time complex. Basically, if you find the node, uh, the first time you find the node, it's the longest road, and then the next time it's the second if longest. Every time there is an update coming it's for each edge, uh, then it's going to be like this. Yes. So, any questions about this? And the space complex is obviously, since we have V nodes in our queue and V array for the cross reference so that we can apply the updates easily, uh, the space time, the space complex is going to be OB. Any questions? If not, let's continue. And this time, Again, we are given a graph, but we are not just interested in short spec from given source to all the other nodes. This time we are interested in all the short specs. Given any two node pair, we would like to be able to uh, calculate the short spec. Or like we would like to be able to return it in all one time so that we want to pre-compute all of them. So in this example, for example, two to three is six actually, right? Yes. So we can't find it starting from one. So yes. One. Yes. So what is an obvious solution right now for all short spells? It could be maybe once we've collected the short spells from one node, then we can maybe reduce them, but I don't, I don't know if that's for sure. The short but it's not obvious. If you're not sure that it's not a solution, then it's not an obvious solution. <laughs> yes. To do the previous uh, competition like basically we have the short spec code that works from one source node, right? What if I call this for all the nodes? Exactly. So what was my time complexity before it was B uh, plus E log B, right? And if I call this B times, what's going to be my new time complexity? So it's like we can think of this kind of like B cube. So it's going to be dominated by this term, basically. Can we do it better? Maybe we can start uh, shortest path between two nodes, and then we can keep reusing it for next time if it's been requested. Shortest path for two nodes, and then we can keep reusing it. If uh, another pad request to start pass, let's do it, and then we can use that instead of having to calculate it. Yes. It would be a little improvement, but I don't know if it makes a lot of So this is an undirected graph, right? Un undirected, yes, all the graphs that we so have. So for seen. example, in here, if we try to find to miss distance from 2 to 3, we can basically say that 1 to 2 plus 1 to 3 equals to its minimum distance, maybe. Not all the time, right? Yes, but I mean, you guys, you guys are getting the uh, uh, head of the real algorithm. So uh, the real algorithm, it's not super trivial to come up with in short amount of time, but uh, you guys are getting uh, sense of it. So we have already considered the uh, time complexity of this, and now let's look at the all short spec algorithm here. So basically, the algorithm works like this. We are using first k node as intermediate nodes to check if we can find a shorter route with the help of them. So initially, I have all these distances, right? All the edges are the shortest path that I know between any node pair. So from 1 to 4, what is the shortest path that I know? 2. From 2 to 3, what is the shortest path that I know? I don't know. 99 at the beginning. We didn't run anything. If there is an edge in between, then we know that it's 99 at the beginning. Like without doing any kind of calculation, at least I can tell if there is an edge between these two, that's going to be the distance between them. Right? So we start with this. And then what we do is, what if I use another node as an intermediate node to get a shorter path? So now, like, from 1 to 2, 1 to 4, 1 to 3, I have all these uh, short spans, right? So now let's consider this idea. First, I'm going to use 1 as an intermediate node. What is the non short spec from 2 to 4 at the beginning? It is 0. I mean, or infinity. Because at the beginning, we only know about edges in the graph. So from 1 to 2, or actually it's better to just create the matches. 
so we can see this way. And from one to two, I know that it is one. And two to one, it is one. Two to three, it is 99. Two to three, it's 99. Three to four, it is three. One to four, it is three. One to four, it's two. One to four, it's two. So this is, this is the initial knowledge that I know. And after that, what I'm doing is conceptually, first I am considering one as the intermediate node, and the others are infinity. This is what I know at the beginning. And then I say, okay, what if I use one as an intermediate node? From two to four, what is my current node distance? Infinity. And how about using one as an intermediate node and creating two, one, one, four? What is the total distance for this? What is two, one? It is one. So this is one. What is one, four? It is two. Is three less than infinity? Yes. Then now I have a shorter path. So two to four now becomes E3. And we can have update 4 to 2 at the same time too. So if we couldn't find, for example, we chose 1 and it was actually, there was an edge, edge between 2 and 1 and 1 and 4. But we could have chosen a node that <coughs> doesn't have an edge to 2 or 4. For example. I don't understand the question, can you repeat? So we chose 1, right? And at the beginning we start with 1 and then we are going to use 2 as an intermediate node, 4 as an intermediate, oh, sorry, 3 as an intermediate node and finally 4 as an intermediate node. When we chose one, actually we didn't know that two and one has an edge between, right? If it doesn't when we chose one, no, we didn't know, yes. And if it wasn't the case? If, if the, for example, if it wasn't the case, then uh, you would have seen infinity. And you would, you would do like a calculation with infinity plus two, whether it's infinity plus two is less than infinity or not. Okay. Since it's not, it's not going to make any update. Like, is, uh, did you guys understand Murat's question? Like imagine, for example, uh, let's let's actually consider that. So there is no edge between uh, three and one, let's right? Add one more uh, node five, just for. Example. I don't. I, we already have one. Okay. Sure. Three. So there is no uh, there is no edge between three and one. So now let's consider if we can update the distance between three and four uh, by using one as an intermediate node. So right now we are considering three four's current known value, which is three versus three one one four. What is the distance between three and one? Infinity. What is the distance between 1 and 4? 2. So basically I check if infinity plus 2 is smaller than 3 or not. Since it's not smaller, I don't make any updates. So we actually checked it for, like basically what, yes, we, we used 1 as an intermediate for 2, 4, and now we used intermediate 1 as intermediate node for 3, 4, and uh, there is one more that we should use, which is 2, 3, right? There is like two, four, um, two, let me see. So except one, I have like two, four, two, three, two, four, and three, four. So right now, I already checked two, four. And we also checked three, four right now, right? So there is one more, right? We should also check two, three. What is two, three's current value? 99. 99. And if I use one as an intermediate node for two, three, what is the distance between 2 and 1? one? What is the distance between 1 and 3? Infinity. infinity. Therefore, I am checking if 1 plus infinity is less than 99 or not. It's not, therefore I don't update 99. So by using 1 as an intermediate node, I basically updated 2 for distance and the others, they were shorter. Therefore, I didn't apply any updates. So in the next iteration, if we look at this for loop here, like first, we use one as an intermediate node, and then we check if one using one as an intermediate node helps us in any cases or not. And if it, if it does, then we just do the update. And in the second iteration of this, 
we check what if I use two as an intermediate node? So let's try to make it a little more systematic. Sorry, today I'm not using the whiteboard very well. So we are done with using one as an intermediate node. So now we are going to check using two as an intermediate node. Which other pairs do I have except two in this graph? Like I have one three, one four, and three four. Right? So, what is current distance of one tree? Infinity. What is the current distance of one four? What is the current distance of three four? Three. Okay. So, right now, first we are checking if by using two as an intermediate node we can beat infinity or not. What is the distance between one and two? One. What is the distance between two and three? 99. Oops, sorry. 99. So, is one plus 99 less than infinity? Yes. <laughs> Come on, you are a solution. <laughs> Since it's less than infinity, I do update one three and replace it with 100. And also, I do update three one and replace it with 102. So, let's continue with the second one. For one, for the best known solution is two, and now we consider one, two, two, four is beating this or not. What is one, two? One, two, one. One, two is one. What is two, four? Three. Three. So, 4 couldn't be 2, therefore I don't make any updates. And finally, I consider for 3, 4, using 1 as intermediate node. What is the distance between 3 and 1? 100. 100. And 1 and 2? 100. 1 didn't beat 3, therefore I didn't make any updates. So, we are done with using 2 as an intermediate node too. Now, the next one is using 3 as an intermediate node. So, what's that? On the last three, three. Oh, yeah, 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 sorry, sorry, this was supposed to be 4, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> and what was the distance between 1 and 4? It was 2. I mean, again, it couldn't be the result we had, but you're right, it has to be 4, thank you. So, now we are done with using... 2 as an intermediate node, and we are going to use 3 as an intermediate node. So which other pairs do I have? 1, 2, 1, 4, two, three. Yes. What is the current known best for 1, 2? 1. 4, 1, 4? 2. 4, 2, 4? 3. So we are trying to beat this by 1, 3, 2. One, three, four, and one, two, three. sorry, two, three, four. What is one, three? Hundred. One hundred. What is three, two? Ninety-nine. So this couldn't beat, no updates. What is one, three? One hundred. What is three, four? Three, three. So one hundred, three, it couldn't beat, two. And uh, 2, 3 is 99, and 3, 4 is 3. Again, like no updates by using 3 as an intermediate node. And finally, we are checking if we can make any upgrades, we can find any shorter routes by using 4 as an intermediate uh, node. And now I have pairs 1, 2. 1, 3, and 2, 3. What are the current best known? 1, 4, 1, 3. 100, and 4, 2, 3. 99. All right, this is going to be a fun. So, now we are considering 1, 4, 2. What is the distance between 1 and 4? 
What is the distance or it's easier to write it like three? What is the distance between four and two? Five couldn't beat one, therefore I couldn't get any update from this one. three actions. What's that? Four and two is three. Okay, so six couldn't beat one, therefore no updates. And here we have one, four, three pack. What is the distance between one and four? What is the distance between four and three? Is five less than 100? Yeah. I guess so. <laughs> so we get update from this one. And finally, we are considering using four as an intermediate node for two trees, best distance so far. Two, four, three. What is the distance between two and four? Three. What is the distance between four and three? Three. Three plus three is six. Which? Minasir. <laughs> <laughs> six is less than 99, therefore I do the update in my table. These guys become six, six. Did we find all the shortest paths? And Actually, are you guys able to see that like we are not just considering using only one intermediate node? Because every time, like for example, if one tree was updated, let's say we have more nodes in our uh, graph. Like let's say one five was updated with using two as an intermediate node. Like the path was actually more like one, two, five, right? And then in the future, let's say I found shorter distance between two and five by using three as an intermediate node. So this would be like one, two, three, five. So the conceptual paths that we are considering can have more than one month, more than one intermediate node. And this is because like when we use one as an intermediate node, we make some updates. And on top of that, if you make some updates using four as an intermediate node, you can actually consider some paths whose length is four. This is such a simple algorithm but it's a very powerful one. So, there are two things I want to discuss about this one. Is everybody able to see the four loops here? So right now, this is clear and cube, right? Can we make it not asymptotically better, but practically better? When progressing through the nodes, if you have greater weight than we have before, you have to stop. If we have greater this uh, node at the weight than the saved one, we have to stop. Like, are you going to break from the loop? No, I'm just, um, for example, if... Uh, like, let's, let's write the code on the whiteboard. I think it's going to be easy to stop that. So this is the cause. Yes, face out right now. Like I am basically, I, I kind of understand what you are saying, but it's a little hard to apply in this execution, right? So I am actually looking for practical suggestions to make less computation in this for loops. Actually, there is a hint on how we execute it on here. Like as I said, we are not going to improve our asymptotic time complexity, but we are going to improve our practical time complexity. Meaning if we divide it by two, for example, 
It's going to be practically improvement, right? But it's not going to change that into the time complexity. Yes? J couldn't possibly start from I? J could possibly start from I. Yes? And then? I or like since the self distances are already uh, zero, we can say I plus one. And uh, is this going to be correct if we just do this? If you are going to remind it starts from K plus one. I starts from K plus one. Is it going to work? I have no <laughs> then have an idea. Because I didn't understand this either. Why, why does it work? Like right now, is this working? Let's start with this. This is one. Is this working? Yes. Okay. So right now, I didn't say that this is working. Okay. I thought it got. I'm saying like no, 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 no. That's that's a good start. But do we have to make any modifications? It's counter. What's that? We have to see if it's counter. Yes. So basically, we should say. This ji is equal to this ij is equal to this. So there is no reason to consider them separate, right? If the graph is undirected, which is the case here, if the graph was directed, this wouldn't, this we, we cannot make this prony. But since the graph is unweighted, we can do that. And this way, the inner resection is not is, is not going to be n square, but uh, we will have a division factor. So is everybody clear with this prony? So we made practical improvement. And now let's consider Murat's idea. So let's move this to one. Actually, this is also related with can we change the order of loops? And we make this k plus one. What will happen? There's no proof that it could uh, connect only the elements after it, so we can't really tell if. I mean it could, for example, if we if our k is Two or something, you could connect any element from one before it or from after it, so we can't really tell. So yes, therefore there is no uh, correctness guarantee here. So if you remember, with the help of the first loop, what we are doing is we are considering Kate node as an intermediate node. And if we make it like this, like without this, right? If we make it like this, what happens is we never consider node K as an intermediate node for nodes between uh, that starts from something less than k and that is greater than yes this is j okay from okay from my picture yeah i didn't even understand at the beginning that k is actually the intermediate one. yes k is the intermediate one i'm <laughs> saying Wait, if it was k plus one, since j starts from one, will it work? If you only have this, it's not going to work. J i is equal to i j. This time it would work. K plus one? Yeah, makes sense. Like, because basically you consider every pair again. How about if we change the order of loops? You mean k? What's that? Swapping with k? Which order? Like we, for example, execute k here and i on the top. This would mean i is connecting k and j, so. We need to modify that. In we are not modifying it. We are just. That's the question. Yeah. I mean, if we are modifying, come on. You rename the variable. You say we need to modify it to make it. Better. I think it will still work. And by logic, it should work. By logic. I mean, J didn't change. I didn't change. J didn't change. So why shouldn't it work? I mean, the. <laughs> I mean, we're just still uh, doing the... What is your, uh, like, what is here, like, what is your intermediate node? I would be the intermediate node. Oh, your intermediate node is K, right? Yeah. Okay. No, when, 
right now I will. And I mean, by this, by this, by this, k is your intermediate power. Right? So k is your intermediate node. Are you considering k as an intermediate node for all the combinations in the right order? Is there a right order? First, that's the question. There is no right order. If you are considering it for all the pairs, it's going to get worked anyways. Right? How about this? This will work. <laughs> I am quite sure. <laughs> quite sure? Yeah, you know, just gamble, gamble. <laughs> this will work because it doesn't matter. Anything, nothing matters, basically. <laughs> nothing matters. <laughs> if you make the I plus combination at this, this the I. <laughs> 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 All right. So, I give I give this as a homework. Okay. So after implementing all short spec, please try it in a big array, like big graph, to see if you always produce the same order with all these uh, little plays that we have made. Not all of them are working. This this is the It's right. It's right. <laughs> and finally. We are going to learn the definition of minimum spanning tree today. As I said, for the optimal algorithm, it would be great to know disjoint sets. And in our next lecture, first, I want to talk about disjoint sets and then go into minimum spanning tree. But there is no harm in learning the definition of minimum spanning tree. And before minimum spanning tree, is there something that we should know? We should know about the spanning tree, right? Otherwise, <laughs> how are we going to know the minimum <laughs> Yes. So, a spanning tree is a tree that connects all the nodes in the graph with a subset of edges. Let's say this is our given graph. Is this a spanning tree? If we get the graph completely? Yeah. No. No. No, it's not a tree. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. But if you remove any of the edges, but if you remove only one edge, then they are all going to be spanning trees for this graph. Basically, the tree need to connect, needs to connect all the nodes in the graph. That's the only condition for spanning tree. And when we say minimum spanning tree, we actually mean that the spanning tree, whose total of uh, weights of edges is going to be minimum. So, for this example, I think it's very obvious, we have only one minimum spanning tree, which is getting this one, two, and three. Like once we remove the maximum edge for this graph, we get the minimum spanning tree. But like one, ninety, ninety, this was a spanning tree, but it wasn't minimum. And I say S spanning tree, the reason is there can be multiple minimum spanning trees. Like imagine if all the weights were one, or if all the weights were two. There are four different spanning trees, right? We can remove any of the edges, and the remaining ones are going to be minimum spanning trees. So it's like dynamic programming solution. We can say an optimal solution, but we cannot say the optimal solution. So it's the same here. We can say a minimum spanning tree. There is no guarantee that it's going to be unique. Yes? I, I don't get the cycling. Is this not a spanning? This is uh, like this is spanning graph. It's not a tree, right? First of all. Oh, okay. So what I was saying is, you can remove any of the edges here, but only one edge is gonna be removed. Like for example, one, two, three, four. Like this is a spanning tree for this graph. It's indeed not just a spanning tree, but it's a minimum spanning tree. And another one can be, like we can remove one, two edge. And then one four, four three, and three two. So this is another spanning tree, and also this is another minimum spanning tree. So if there is an edge between one and three, get there. So that means you can find the spanning tree. 
Can you find a spelling tree in this one? Of course. <laughs> like you don't have to get this edge. Like for example, let's say if this edge was weight, this edge weight was one, then these wouldn't be minimum spelling trees anymore. Because in this case, the minimum spelling trees have to contain this one edge. Therefore, like minimum then like these are gonna be just spanning trees. So the minimum spanning trees, one of the minimum spanning trees from this graph would be having one tree with one, and then you can connect all the others with twos. And just leave this would be the minimum spanning tree. One of the minimum spanning trees. You can remove multiple edges, right? Let's look at the definition, Daniel. Spanning tree is a tree that connects all the vertices of the graph with subset of the edges. It's a tree. Like, if it's a spanning tree, it must be a tree, right? It's a tree. And the other condition is it needs to include all the nodes. So now let's take a look. I mean, it doesn't say anything about you, know, you can remove these edges, you don't have to remove that edges. No, there is no such thing. Focus on the definition. It has to include all the nodes. It has to connect all the nodes, and it has to be three. So is this a spanning tree? Like it has all the nodes, right? We have four nodes, and they are all connected. And is this a tree? Yes. Let's look at this one. Is this connecting all the nodes? Is this a tree? That's a spanning tree too. But at the same time, this has minimum total edge weight. That's why this is minimum spanning tree. We are gonna we are gonna talk more about this because today we are not gonna cover the algorithms. How to find minimum spanning tree? Yes. So a spanning tree must have v minus one edge, right? Yes. And I mean, if because you have uh, in a tree with v nodes, how many edges you are gonna have? V minus one. And number of minimum spanning trees are basically edge combination v minus one. Right? It depends on the graph. I mean, it can be one if I just give you the tree. <laughs> that means that edge combination V minus one is edge com what edge combination? Edge combination of edge and V minus one. What do you mean combination edges. of number of edges? Number of edges and V minus one. Like this? Yeah. Mm. Probably not necessarily. Yes, I mean in, the, in different graphs, I think you're going to have different structures. Let's think about it. Because you're basically saying, like, I can remove that many edges, but uh, there can be some edges that cannot be removed. Like, imagine this. Oh, actually, yeah. <coughs> like here, for example. I will go up. Just... Murat, are you listening? He's trying to get the motion to the okay. plan. Okay, okay. So here. All these edges, they are optional. You can remove all of them, but, one, so is not but this is not an optional edge. So that's why it's, I, I think it's going to be hard to get with that kind of uh, yes. formula for, that fits to all the graphs. Okay, any questions about minimum, minimum spanning tree or spanning tree? I mean, we are going to cover this in another lecture, so uh, don't worry about it if it's not super clear in your mind. But let's just now get familiar with the definition, then uh, we are going to go into the details of how we can find minimum spanning tree in an efficient way in our next lecture. And before we finish, so the questions are coming for short spec and all short spec. And, and as always, we are going to finish with the code of the day. And today's code is, judge nothing, you will be happy. Because we usually become unhappy by our judgments. That's true. Forgive everything, you will be happier because sometimes some people are going to do wrong things and in that case if you forgive them, you're not going to feel bad about their mistakes. So you're going to be even happier. Love everything, you will be the happiest. So I think it's also very obvious, right? And you guys are in Ethiopia and Ethiopia is the country of love. So I think we can learn it from you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.